I am waiting. Uh, looks like I'm live on Facebook. I cannot see if I'm live on YouTube. So let me know, Zach, are we live? So hey, I'm Paul Moore with Wellings Capital and Bigger Pockets, and I'm excited to join you in 2020 for our first um, live stream of the year. Uh, Zach, I can't see the comments, but I can see that we are live on Facebook. So hopefully the comments and questions will start flowing here. Hey, Bill Dixon in Colorado Springs, good to see you. So we are investing on Platt Avenue in Colorado Springs in a large self-storage facility. So glad to uh, have you on board. Um, so before we get started in our first show of 2020, I want to give you 10 reasons not to invest in real estate. Now you may say, Paul, I thought we were going to talk about why we should invest in real estate and how to be successful in commercial real estate. Uh, thanks, Armand. Thanks, Daryl. Hey, thank you. I love the lamp too. Um, so, um, hey, Alfonso Wright, can you hear me over on the YouTube side? No one has said they can hear me yet, but I think I'm on. Hey, Magnificent Seven. Uh, we're going to talk about 10 reasons not to invest in real estate. And you may say, Paul, I, I'm here to learn to invest in real estate, but we're going to talk about how, why not to invest in real estate. So number one, reason not to invest in real estate. Your life savings is also your emergency fund. You need immediate access to every cent at any given moment. Number two, reason not to invest in real estate. You prefer buying gold because you plan to be a pirate someday. Arg. Number three, you'd rather spend money on a fancy car that will be worth more in 10 years than it is today. Oh, wait a minute. Number four, Reason not to invest in real estate. Real estate investing has too much jargon. And you'd rather die than have to learn anything new. Number five, what's leverage again? Huh? Okay, number six, you're too busy mining cryptocurrency. Number seven, reason not to invest in real estate. You want your paycheck to be your only income you generate. Number eight, you like seeing the red and green arrows up and down on the stock tickers. Number nine, reason not to invest in real estate. You don't believe in diversification. And number 10, reason not to invest in real estate. You don't want anything to do with cash flow, right? Okay, great. Hopefully you had a little fun with that. Um, glad you all can hear me. Hey, Stoner. Hey, Alfonso. Great to see you. Anthony Shannon, Omer Turhan. Uh, thanks, Zach. Appreciate that. Chris Wagoner. Hey, Kyle. Okay, great. So glad uh, you guys are all here. And I am excited today. We're going to talk about seven, seven ways you can get success in commercial real estate. Now, lots of people realize that they want to be involved in commercial real estate. I talked to a guy, I talked to two people today one in my office and one on the phone just now, who've been involved in rental real estate for many, many years. And they said they're tired of toilets, tenants, and trash. They're tired of all the hassles. One guy, a guy from Connecticut I just met today, Elliot, hopefully he's watching, um, he said that he had a, he has, he had a great commercial property and he was actively involved in renting it. He's got a bunch of singles, duplexes, triplexes as well. He had a fire at one of his properties and he spent about a year himself overseeing the management. It was 90 minutes away. So he was on the road for an hour and a half each way, three hours a day, working really hard. He's in his mid 60s and he's working really hard to update and fix and rehab this property who he couldn't trust a general contractor with. I mean, even when you think you've got it all figured out, you've got your systems in place, your property management team, you got everything going, you get somebody with a, a candle uh, making production in your that they're doing out of the rental property you're renting them, and they burn half of it down. And so there's a lot of reasons to be involved in commercial real estate. And um, I'm going to give you seven paths to get there. Like I said, a lot of people know they want to be involved. A lot of people know that the wealthiest people in the world are involved in commercial real estate. At the same time, 
they don't know. They're confused on how to get started. They're confused on where to invest, who to trust. And so we're going to go over some of that today. So the first of the seven paths to success in commercial real estate is to build slowly. And here's what I mean by that. Start with a single family house if you're not there yet. Fix it up, rent it out, sell it, take the profits and buy a duplex. Do the same thing, buy a fourplex. Fix it, rent it, sell it, buy an eightplex. This is a little different from the BRRR strategy that Brandon Turner has so well laid out for us uh, and David Green has uh, done successfully. This is uh, basically where you sell the property, you take all the proceeds, not just the refinance proceeds, and then you just go up to the next level. And I know a guy in Arlington, Texas, which is near Dallas, um, who did this. He started with a duplex and $1,000 out of his pocket in 1993. And he did the duplex and the four, then the eight, then the 12, then the 20, then the third. And he was selling, when I talked to him, he had an $11.5 million property he was selling. And he was probably going to jump up from there to a $16 million pro property. Now that was over 23 years from 93 to 2016. Pretty impressive run though. And it's something that you can do and it will work. There's a lot of hard times, a lot of slog along the way, but it is a great way to do it. Aaron, we're going to talk about Airbnb uh, more before we're done here. So number two path to success in commercial real estate, be a millionaire. Now, Steve Martin had a joke way back when he said, how do I pay? A, how do I be a millionaire and never pay taxes? You ask me, Steve, how can I be a millionaire and never pay taxes? Well, first, get a million dollars. Second, okay, that wasn't that funny anymore. But anyway, so the point of that is if you have a million dollars, let's say you sold a company, maybe you invested in Bitcoin <laughs> and it went really well. Like a friend of mine did that. Actually, he sold near the top of the market. Um, maybe you inherited money. Maybe you won the lottery. Maybe you invested in some tech company or in Shark Tank company or something. But if you have a million dollars, you can actually go in and jump in at a high level. You can hire a property manager, uh, outsource asset management team, outsource a CPA, and do a great job in um, getting a team around you investing in commercial property. That's not very many of us. So let's jump to the third level. Next, you can be a deal finder. Um, a deal finder is somebody who goes, has a, a really good insight into deals. In other words, you may know self-storage owners or apartment owners or mobile home park owners. You don't want to manage the property yourself. You don't want to own it yourself, but you're willing to bring those Wow. Hey, thank you, everybody. I accidentally hit the, uh, the mute. So your goal in this third path is to be a deal finder. Okay. So the deal finder is the third path. And that is where you have some kind of insight into, uh, you have some kind of insight into different deals. In other words, you can find uh, a self-storage deal. Maybe you can find a mobile home park. Maybe you know some apartment owners and um, you can bring those deals to an operator. Okay. And so by bringing those deals to an operator, you can get involved in the business. Now, if you're a broker, like a commercial real estate broker, you can get a commission, but that's where it ends. That's not bad. But if you actually are a deal finder, you can actually bring that deal to the operator and you can say, look, I want to stay involved. 
you negotiate where maybe you get 10% ownership in that deal for being the deal finder. Deals are really hard to find these days. And if you've got an uncle in the business or if you want to drive around spending a lot of time beating the bushes, um, if you there, there's a lot of things you can do to bring deals to an operator. You might actually, you know, you might actually want to work the phones. I mean, I know guys working the phones to find deals. You can mail postcards. You can do better. You can do like my son does and write handwritten letters, okay? And you can when you write handwritten written letters, you can actually find deals that nobody else is turning up. You can drive for dollars. If you bring deals and then ask for a piece of ownership, you can also ask the commercial real estate operator to stay involved. And if you can stay involved in the deal, you can learn the business. If you can learn the business, you can eventually do it on your own. So being a deal finder is the third path to commercial real estate success. By the way, we're going to have a wonderful time of Q&A after this. So hold your questions till later and we will, um, uh, I'll get to everyone I can. Next path would be to be a money finder. Now this capital raiser, money finder. It is a very, very risky way to go. And the reason it's risky is there are all kinds of SEC regulations which prohibit people from raising money for other people's deals. Okay. And so if you uh, want to do this, you need to make sure you do it right. Make sure you do it legally and make sure you've got some attorneys who are, you know, blessing what you're doing. And so, um, but being a money finder means you have, maybe you're an NFL football player. I've got an investor who was the um, uh, MVP in the Super Bowl uh, a number of years ago. Well, he's got access to all kinds of people, his teammates and coaches with money. Well, you know, by being involved with those guys, he can introduce them to syndicators, that's operators, and maybe he can raise money for them. Now, again, it's not easy to do this legally. You've got to do it right. You've got to do it legally. I'll just tell you there are ways to do it. Now, my good friend, Matt Faircloth, who wrote a great book on Bigger Pockets about how to raise private money. You should check in with Matt Check in with Bigger Pockets. Uh, again, it's a great book. Check it out. There's other books out there about raising capital, and it is a great. Uh, I'm actually writing a uh, a post on Bigger Pockets right now about how to raise capital for your real estate deals, and so um, check that out when you get a chance. Now, a fourth path. The fourth path is raising money. A fifth path is get a job. Now you may say, Paul, I came here to Bigger Pockets because I don't like my job. I want to get out of my job. I'm tired of working for the man. And that makes sense. But there is a place and a time in life where it could make sense for you to get a job in real estate. And there's four good jobs. Number one would be to be a commercial real estate broker. You get to know the lingo, the numbers, you know how to crunch the numbers. You you get in with the, the sellers, the buyers, the property managers. You get to know the business, and you may be able to use that to launch your own business someday. Maybe you'll find a partner that way. A second way is through being a commercial lender. So getting a job as a loan broker with a commercial real estate lender. Uh, there's lots of lenders out there. There's some local, some regional, some national. Become a real estate uh, commercial lender and you will get to know the lingo. You'll get to know how to underwrite. You'll get to know a lot of people. Uh, a third job that would be great would be an asset manager. That'd be going to work for an established large company and helping them manage their assets. And then a fourth path would be a fourth job, I should say, would be to be a property manager. You know, one of the largest owners and property managers in the U.S., um, of uh, multifamily real estate is actually start out as a porter in college. He started out being like more or less a janitor at a multifamily property. And now he's one of the largest owner managers of all properties uh, of multifamily properties in America. He actually wrote a little blurb for my book called The Perfect Investment about multifamily. And so you can check that out. 
Um, the sixth path would be to be a passive investor. Now, this is where my heart beats. Uh, there's a lot of power in passive investing. A lot of times people come to me and they say, hey, I've been beating my head against the wall to make five or six percent uh, working with toilets, tenants, and trash, all this hassle, all this nightmare. I have to get this debt. I got in trouble in 2008, etc." When they don't realize that they could invest passively and make probably more money, the same or more money, and the, all their effort would be involved, the, the effort involved would be checking out the syndicator up front, spent very thoroughly vetting them, and then walking to the mailbox to get their check every month or every quarter. And so that would be uh, another path, and that would be a passive investor. Now, there's active passive and passive passive investors. I wrote an article about this on Bigger Pockets. The passive passive spends a lot of time up front getting to know who they're investing with, sort of like Warren Buffett does with his managers, and then they're hands off. They just basically say, look, I'm going to feed you money. If you're a doctor, a dentist, an attorney, a high-paid tech person, you might want to do this. Basically, you find somebody you totally trust, you get to know them, and then you just feed them money, maybe fifty, hundred, two hundred thousand dollars a year, and you let them manage it. An active active investor, on the other hand, does the same vetting process up front. They get to know the operator really well, but then they get involved in every deal. And that might be another way to go for you. Be an active passive investor. So you stay on the phone, you're, you're going out on due diligence, you're getting to know every deal, and you're not just trusting the operator. The Warren Buffett model is my favorite, and that is getting to know the operator really, really well, and then staying at least somewhat involved in all the deals, not overreaching, not taking over, but staying involved in all the deals. He has basically done for in the equity world what we're recommending people do in the real estate world, and that is be a somewhat active, passive investor. You know, Warren Buffett doesn't make ice cream, but he owns Dairy Queen. He doesn't write insurance policies himself, but he owns Geico and dozens of other things. He doesn't make mobile homes, but he owns Clayton Homes. He doesn't write mobile home mortgages, but he owns 21st Mortgage and partially owns Burcadia Commercial Mortgage. So Warren Buffett uh, is the model that my company, Wellings Capital, is going after as we invest and as our investors come alongside us and invest in commercial real estate. The seventh path is one of my favorites as well, and that is get a coach or a mentor. Now, I've written about this a lot on Bigger Pockets as well. If you want to get a paid coach, which is what I've done three different times in my career, I've spent a good uh, slug of money, four times actually now, to get a coach. I just hired a new one and uh, really excited to do that. This is actually not a real estate coach. This is just a general business life coach. But did you know Tom Brady and the greatest athletes in the world, they have coaches. You know this. Michael Jordan has coaches. Different uh, professional musicians and um, athletes and others have great coaches. So I highly recommend spending the money, investing in yourself to get a coach. Sometimes they can be expensive, but in my case, I can say everyone I've ever had that I can recall has paid off really, really well. Now, another way to do it would be to get a mentor. Now, a mentor would be sort of the apprentice master relationship that they, was real popular in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries in uh, America. And that would be where you get a, you're not paid, but you go to work for somebody and they teach you their trade. If you've got a great operator in your hometown or somewhere near you and you're really good at SEO or you're really good at website advertising or digital marketing or uh, Excel spreadsheets, whatever it is, you can go to them and offer your services and ask them to bring you along, let you hang out in their office, get to know them, etc. cetera. Uh, so those are the seven paths. And there's lots of other great ways to get involved in real commercial real estate. Um, where do you find a coach or mentor, Ad Ad says. V23 says, and they need a mentor. Well, uh, 
Bigger pockets. I would just put a forum post out, guys and gals. I would just put a forum post and said, who do you recommend as a mentor? Uh, there's mentors like Joe Fairless, who just a year and a half ago were charging like $12,000. He's up to $50,000 right now. That's how popular he is. You know what? I don't, don't quote me on that. I've heard he's up to 40 or I had heard 40, then I heard recently $50,000. Joe's uh, worth it. I've been on his podcast a couple of times, and he is a great, he, he has helped friends like Whitney Sewell, a friend of mine, who have just really grown their real estate business tremendously. And I do recommend that you get involved with someone like them, or Michael Blanc, an, another Bigger Pockets favorite. Uh, Michael's got all kinds of different coaching programs, 37th Parallel. That's who I went with. And 37th Parallel, they charge $25,000. But I mean, they, I've got a lifetime subscription to issues, whatever. I've got a lifetime subscription to talk to the CEO and the management team at 37th Parallel anytime I want to. And I love those guys over in Richmond, Virginia. There's all kinds of other paid coaches like Rod Cleave and Jake and Gino. They're involved in bigger pockets. Um, mentors. It's hard to tell you how to find a mentor. I know that I wrote an article about a lady in San Francisco in 2008. She had lost, actually she quit her job and she spent a long time soul search. And then she spent, sent 42 letters out to um, property, commercial real estate firms in the San Francisco area. And she actually heard back from four. I think she interviewed with three and she took a mentoring position with one of them and after about 90 days, they said, you're way too valuable just to sit around our office for free. And they started paying her. Well, now fast forward 11 years, she is the largest commercial real estate rental uh, agent in San Francisco. That's a pretty big deal. Her record rental was, I think it was $23,000 for a, either a house or condo, $23,000 a month in rent. She rented out in the... Uh, Bay City of San Francisco. So anyway, mentoring, coaching is a great way to go. Okay, folks, um, there are other paths. You can get involved in Airbnb. And if you all want to know a strategy that I love for corporate rentals and Airbnb, if anybody asks, I'll explain it. You can also do subject to loans. That's a way to get started, which is also known as a rent to own or lease option sandwich. Um, we, uh, we can uh, we can talk about it. So any if you all want to ask me about that or anything else, I will do my best to answer your questions. So, um, hey, Devin Fitzgerald, Marietta College alumni, petroleum geologist in the house. Hey, Devin, I went to Marietta College and I got a petroleum engineering degree. When did you go? That's awesome. Um, A.G. Silverbane says, hey, A.G., if you don't have the reputation as an investor, how do you get additional financing from partners? You know, A.G., I talked to Whitney Sewell for quite a while this morning, and he didn't, he needed, he was faced with that exact problem for a number of years. And he said what he did is he started a daily podcast. And by putting out a whole lot of content on places like Bigger Pockets and on podcasts, Whitney was able to dramatically increase his reputation and his ability to get um, investors. Dean Birmingham, hey Dean, says, how does Orlando property compare to Miami and Miami Beach area for vacation rentals? Which has the best opportunity? Um, you know, I, I don't have the answer to that, Dean. I know a little bit about Orlando and a little bit about Miami, but I don't know which one's better. So, hey, Charles Colmeyer from Austin. Hey, Tu Fang, just finished your perfect investment book. Do you still believe in the perfect investment in 2020 with compressing, compressing cap rates? Tu Fang, my friend from Minneapolis, St. Paul, thank you for asking. He's talking about my book called The Perfect Investment. Hey, Tu, if you can give me a review on Amazon, my goal was to get to 100 reviews by New Year's. I think I got to like 99, so I'd love for you to put it over the top. If anybody else has read it, uh, or if you want a free copy on a PDF version, if you'll give me a review, I will send you a PDF copy. Just reach out to me there at my Bigger Pockets profile. Yolanda Dean says, I'm in corporate. Can you explain the corporate Airbnb? Yes, I can. Two, I still believe in everything I wrote in the book called The Perfect Investment. 
which is how to harness wealth and value from the commercial, the sh historic shift to commercial multifamily real estate. The problem is millions, well, I don't want to exaggerate, many, many, many thousands of others believe in it as well. And as a such, they've compressed the cap rates to such a low level, meaning the prices are at such a high level, that it's very, very hard to get a good deal. So while I believe in everything I wrote in chapter four and chapter eight, which are the kind of the key chapters of my book, which explain the demographics of multifamily, that's all true still. The problem is it's overheated right now. And that is why I have expanded to self-storage and mobile home parks, where there's a lot of mom and pop operators and a lot of opportunities that you can never find in multifamily these days. So I believe it. I think we're going to need to wait till it cools off. Ed Moran says Orlando's better. So Dean, he's over on the Facebook side. So if you want to jump over to the Facebook feed, you can maybe interact with Ed Moran. Thank you, Ed. Scott Goulet says, I have a couple rental properties. What, rental properties. What do I need to do in order to have them qualified for commercial financing? Scott, I would start at a small local bank or credit union, take them to lunch, get to know them, ask them that same question, go out with a bunch of these type folks, go out with lenders, and you'll see what they tell you. Start small, don't go to a big national or international bank, start with a local small bank. My son, who's in the next office here, is uh, he started out with no credit score at all. He wasn't even out of college yet, and he convinced a local lender to give him some fantastic loans on his uh, properties. And he would never have probably got that from a huge national lender. Now he's building up his reputation, his history, his repayment history, and now they're willing to give him more and more money. And now he can probably go to a national lender as well. Um, Magno Mora, so sorry, I didn't pronounce that right. Paul, how can we scale from residential to multifamily? We have several under our belts, but I want to get into apartments. That's a great question. Uh, reach out to me. I'll send you a free copy of my book, the PDF, or you can get the hard copy on Amazon. It, it, tell, it answers that exact question. Um, and I hope, you know, I, again, I think that the best way to do that would be wait till it cools off a little bit. Like I said a minute ago. Uh, maybe consider mobile home parks and self-storage like we are. Um, thanks, Scott. Uh, Magno Mora again says, I have a small mobile home park with four trailers and eight acres. Should I sell and use the money for apartments or add on more mobile homes? Magno, that's a long, uh, there's a long answer to that. I don't know that I can fully answer it right here, but I'll tell you, I recommend going. Frank Rolfe, was on the Bigger Pockets podcast in July. Check that podcast out. He talks about that. And then consider going to his or one of the other great mobile home park investment courses out there. Learn all you can. Um, check, Magno, check in with 21st Mortgage. That's Warren Buffett's company. They do financing on mobile homes. They might be, help, be able to help you place some mobile homes there finance them for the tenants and help you grow the park. If it was me, at this time in history, I would absolutely grow the mobile home park. Um, but I would do it slowly. Don't bring in 10 mobile homes at once. Bring in one at a time, maybe two, and then do a great job marketing those. Try to find some used ones. You know you, know you can get them used. So Jerry Mills says, what's your thoughts on the infinite banking concept using the IBC model? You know, I've got some friends, Jerry, who who do this. And um, actually, my son, MC Laubscher, is a great guy. MC is um, in the same coaching program with me. He's also uh, involved on Bigger Pockets. He does this, and he really likes it. Um, and I recommend that you check that out. I've also, my son actually invests invested with a guy named Mark Willis. He's in Chicago. He does the infinite banking concept. Uh, I've got a friend in Louisville who does it. I've got others who have been on, have been on our podcast, the How to Lose Money podcast that do it. And, um, you know, I would uh, check some of those out. It, you got to check out for yourself and see if it fits your situation. But Jerry, my son, did it and he loves it. So, 
Uh, Magno Mora says, what Bigger Pockets episode? It was with Frank Rolfe. I believe it's spelled R O L F E. And that was on the Bigger Pockets regular podcast in July of 2019, six months ago. Ed Moran says, every housing boom has a subsequent recession. Ideas on where we stand in the housing curve and what's your assessment of when a recession might come? You know, Ed, Warren Buffett and his friend Howard Marks, who have written extensively about this exact issue, will not predict when the recession's going to come. And so I just realized it's probably not smart to predict the severity or the timing of any recession. But I will tell you this, we're six months we're now seven months longer than the longest expansion, economic expansion in U.S. history. So that should tell us something. These trees don't grow to the sky, okay? And there's no way this expansion can continue uh, indefinitely. Um, I don't know when it'll turn down. I've got friends who think it's going to turn down badly this year in 2020. I've got other friends who think it's going to go on for maybe three more years. So I really don't know. Um, and there's always signs of a recession, but there's always signs of a continuing expansion. There's just no way to tell where we are. Bradford Brown says, if you were starting today in this market with 50K to invest, which strategy would you use? Bradford, uh, depends what your long-term goals are. Do you want to do this full-time or part-time? Do you want to be a passive investor or stay actively involved? Do you want to own and operate? Uh, are you concerned about the tax savings? I mean, everybody wants tax savings, but I mean, are you obsessed with it to the point of like a California doctor who's paying this outrageous tax amount? Or are you, you know, in Tennessee with a smaller tax amount? Um, Jerry Mills uh, asks, who's the contact in Louisville that offers IBC model? If you would please reach out to me, I will give you his direct contact info. Tu Fang says, what do you think will cause multifamily to cool off? I don't know. There's so many reasons it's continuing to stay overheated. I think it's just overbuilding would be one thing. Um, you know, just a general recession would be a second. So Bradford Brown's clarifying he wants to do buy and hold. You know, I think I would do maybe try to do a handful of flip houses and get your stash of cash up from 50 to maybe 100 to 150,000 and then start buying, you know, using the Burr method. You know, you know that, right? So you buy, you rehab, you rent it out, you refinance and pull all the cash out you can safely. And then Bradford, you do it again. So the last R is repeat. So I would use the Burr method. Um, Bradford, if, 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 especially if you want to be actively involved. Now, if you want to be passively involved, I would find a great syndicator or operator to invest that money with and really trust them to do the heavy lifting. Okay, so... Um, I am doing my best. I can see we got a large crowd on here today and we got more than I, I can answer. So uh, thanks, Chris Wagner, Taylor Smith, um, Anthony Shannon. Hello, Douglas Jimenez from New York City. Hey, Doug. Um, Jason says these are jokes. Yeah, we've done a lot of joking around here. You're welcome, Bradford. Uh, happy New Year, Sylvia. Happy New Year to Bill D from Florida. Has some great deals. Can't wait to get in, into. Okay, yeah, Florida. Florida is one of the best places in America, by the way, to make a ton of money when the timing's right. And it's the best place or one of the top places to lose money when the timing's wrong. Their cycles are so violent. I mean, they go up so high in good times like they are now which is time to sell, and they go down so low in bad times, which is a great time to buy. And so, hey, Ken Breeze from Germany, welcome. Um, so, you know, Florida is a great place to invest if you're careful. Be very careful, though. I don't think the time right now when I'm recording this, January 3rd of 2020, is the best time to invest. Alfonso Wright says, how do you get good people to work for you? That's really hard. 
for rehabilitation. I have someone right now renovating an apartment for me and not doing a good job and trying to steal material every chance they get. Yeah, don't pay them in advance. Pay them a little better and maybe put them on a profit sharing program. You know, try to get a, a profit sharing program and try to get one person you really, really trust. Um, and I hope that is helpful. It's very hard right now. What county in Florida is good to invest? You know, Angie, e, even Jacksonville, which is, you know, practically Georgia, like really close to Savannah, Georgia, it's still experienced the same pain and agony that Miami, which is in South Florida, Orlando in Central Florida did in the last recession. I don't know if there's one that's better than another. There's other folks on here, though, that know much more about Florida than me. Folks, feel free to answer each other's questions. Would love to have you do that because I only have a fraction of the answers to your questions. Um, Iceman says, is it more worth, is it better to become a REA before buying a house or just hire one? Real estate agent. Um, I don't think you have to be an agent. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I think that you could, uh, you can hire one. And then if you really get into it and you have a good reason to become an agent, that's great. I think that's what you're asking. Lee Prado says, can I still get into real estate with bankruptcy on my credit score? Uh, yes, you can definitely do wholesaling. Someone asked, by the way, if I need a license to do wholesaling. No, you don't. You can actually do Airbnb. You can do corporate. Oh, yeah, I was supposed to answer that question on corporate and Airbnb. I promise to get back to that. Um, Yenny, or, yeah, Yenny says, do you basically buy a house for sale then put it on rent? Um, yeah, that's something that you can do. That's definitely a very popular strategy, Renny. Josh says, how do you feel about RV parks considering so many people are going into RV living? You know, I've heard from experts, including a close friend of mine I invested with once 20 years ago, that they're not as good as mobile home parks. And I'm not clear about why. So um, that's all I've heard. If anybody else has an opinion on RV uh, uh investment, RV park investment. I'd love to hear. Peso Beats says, I'm starting my own wholesale business. Should I just start making my LLC now or wait till I get my first deal? I'd wait. Don't, yeah, don't spend a lot of time and money putting together a website, an LLC, all that till you need it. You can get an LLC in a matter of hours when the time's right. Uh, and do I need a real estate license? No, you don't, as I mentioned. Okay, so um, I am going to jump over and answer the Airbnb corporate landlording thing. And folks, if you want to make a lot of money quickly, this is one path to doing it. Okay, so step one, you don't have to own any property to do this. You just have to be a good marketing person. So you go out and find a, a home or better yet, a duplex, or better yet, a, a unit in a multifamily property to rent, especially if there's a brand new development, let's say a two or 300 unit apartment building that just opened, you can go and negotiate with the property manager or owner and say, look, you're never gonna fill this place up for two and a half years anyway. Why don't you let me rent one month to month? Then you go furnish it, you get the utilities, you get really nice furnishing stuff right down to the silverware, and then you rent it out. Now you first put it on Airbnb just to get some revenue started. And then you do great photography, by the way. You put it on Craigslist, you do VRBO, all that stuff. And then you go out and start looking for a corporate tenant. And you can do, actually do it in a reverse order. You can find the corporate tenant first, which is how I did this years ago. And once you find the corporate tenant, that's somebody who's willing to pay you a significantly high uh, amount of money to live there for say three to six months in a furnished apartment. They don't have the hassle of getting all the utilities in their name. They don't have to get the water turned on. You get the cable, you get the internet, you have everything already up and running. They can walk right in. They can show up there at 11 p.m. on a Sunday night after driving from Indiana. I don't know why Indiana, but that sounded good when I said it. Uh, the, uh, they, they drive in, they, they, th they throw their suitcase on the bed and they show up for work Monday morning for their three, six or nine month assignment. These can be medical doctors, nurses, physical therapists, engineers, surveyors, visiting professors, all kinds of people would rather live in a furnished apartment than a hotel room. 
look for um, locations in the area of, you know, Homewood Suites or Marriott Residence Inn or other places that have a lot of suites because that's where a lot of people are traveling for work. And so you might be able to rent the place for, and of course, this is very market specific, but you might be able to rent a place for maybe $850 a month at $150 a month in utilities, uh, another 50 bucks a month for miscellaneous. And then you could even rent the furnishings and the furniture or buy it yourself. And then maybe you'll have only 1200 a month in it, let's say, just for example. And then you might be able to rent it for 16, 18, 2000 a month. Now, I've got a friend named Al in Sacramento who trains people to do this. And when I heard about Al, I mean, I was at a conference with Dave Van Horn, another Bigger Pockets favorite. Shout out to Dave. Um, and uh, Dave put on the conference a few years ago, and Al was there, and he explained this. And he was mobbed afterwards with people who were excited to hear about how to do this. Al said he can make like you can make like ten thousand dollars a month on the side without quitting your day job, and so lots of people I know signed up to take this course, and I wrote an article called "How to Make Ten Thousand a Month um, Without Quitting Your Day Job." You can find it on Bigger Pockets, something like that. I've had hundreds and hundreds of comments on this article. Well, um, I have a couple guys. Um, who contacted me right after that article came out. And it was after a, pod, uh, a show like this, and they asked me more about it. They signed up. They did Al's course. Now they're not making 10000 a month. They haven't quit their day jobs, but they're making 70000 a month. Yes, they're grossing. They say they're grossing seven zero seventy thousand a month. Uh, two fang, I would say two or three bedrooms ideal. One bedroom can work. Four bedroom, a little too big, but it could work. Um, they're grossing 70000 a month, and they're netting a net bottom line profit of 30000 a month or more. Can you believe that? And anyway, they did it all from learning this strategy, and they don't have to own any real estate to do it. Now, they own a, a ton of couches and chairs and silverware and you know glasses and bowls and all that. But, and they probably rent some of that, but that is a strategy. It's called the corporate landlord, corporate Airbnb arbitrage strategy. Hopefully that is helpful to somebody today. If you want to know more about Al's training, it's not very expensive. I don't have the link with me, but you can look me up on Bigger Pockets, or you can actually visit my website. And I'm going to tell you that website address if you're ready to write it down and get more information on Al's program. Uh, just reach out to me on Bigger Pockets, where my website is wellingscapital.com. That's W E L L I N G S C A P I T A L, wellingscapital.com forward slash resources. And that will give you the information that you need. Um, hey, so Justin says, What interest rate can I expect to pay for an investment loan on a single family home? home? Hey, I haven't bought a home in like three and a half years, so I'd love to hear from somebody else. Last I heard, 3.5% more or less. Um, I'd love to have somebody correct me with more recent information. Okay, so Armand Duvio III says, I have 230000 in equity. Housing is not as expensive. Is not as expensive in many places. Would you recommend the Burr strategy also by rehab? I'm confused about the refinance part. It seems too good to be true, doesn't it? So property is refinanced. I pay off the HELOC and I just borrow against the HELOC over and over again. Yes, you can. I've done it. It seems like the banks will cut off the refinancing at some point. Okay, uh, go LSU. Okay. Um, so Armand, yeah. It is amazing. Uh, my son is using the strategy. He's using a HELOC. I'm using the strategy. I'm using a HELOC. I'm not actually doing that exact thing right now. But yes, you can. I always recommend getting a HELOC as your first mortgage, by the way, folks. Uh, there's lots of reasons to do it. There's a website called replaceyourmortgage.com. They charge a lot, but you can get an idea what they do from just checking out the website. There's also a YouTube channel, which I haven't been to recently called I think it's VIP financial education VIP financial education they teach you the strategy 
of paying off your HELOC mortgage as your first mortgage ridiculously fast. Basically, you take your paycheck, you put it on, you put it on your HELOC. Any money you get in, you put it on your HELOC. Any money you pay out, you delay it as long as you possibly can. And you just keep your HELOC progressively paid down. And they say with the same payment stream, you can pay off your 30-year mortgage in just six years. And so check those guys out. I don't have any connection to these folks. I think it's, like I said, VIP financial education on YouTube or replaceyourmortgage.com. So, um, all right, where are we at? So Omer Turhan says, what do you think of starting off with hard money loan from a lender? Eh, you know, you can if you've got a sure thing and a short window to get it done, get the work done. One of those loans where you only put down 10%, but it's high interest. For the first three to five years, you pay interest only while you improve the property. Um, you know, I wouldn't really do that for very long. I would keep it really, really short if I was going to do that, Omer. I hope that helps. Um, I think that it's, again, no. just be really careful paying that much in interest. Okay, so um, Omer says, I know it's a rule of thumb for bigger commercial investments to put 25% down, but you can just, when you're starting, it might take a long time to save up. Yeah, go to the local real estate associations, ch talk to your dentist, your doctor, your friends, anybody you can to get some money to put into your deals. That's how I, I actually got started by putting my money into someone else's deals and we partnered together. Uh, so Fiat Lux 89 says, I have about 20,000 saved up. I want to get started with rental property investing. What should I do to start? Consider the Airbnb method I just talked about, Fiat, or consider, um, consider doing a subject to deal. Like that's where you go in, somebody's in trouble with their mortgage. You, ca you basically sign a contract with them that they move out. They keep their mortgage in place. You put you put the deal in a land trust, and and then you rent it out to somebody else. You keep that original mortgage in place, but you rent it to somebody else for a profit. And there's no guarantee you can do it. There's no guarantee you can do it forever. But you say, look, I'll pay this mortgage as long as I can. I'll keep you out of foreclosure. You say that to the seller. And the buyer gets the benefit of renting a nice house and maybe it's a rent to own deal and you set a really high resale price on it since they're buying in the future after inflation, right? And then you make a nice, um, you make a nice profit. Now keep in mind 70 to 80% of rent to own or lease to own deals or lease option deals never close. So make sure you're making a, month, a profit every month. Um, so, um, okay. Hey, Glenn Vite, Chico. I'm a commercial. Frederick Jackson says, I'm a commercial property manager. How can I jump into ownership? Just get to know everybody you can and uh, try to uh, provide some value to them outside of work and then see, you know, get to know them outside of work and um, just do your best. Um, uh, to get to know people and see how you can add value. Just start serving other people. You're probably already doing that now. Serve other people and then see where you can fit in. That's, that's what I would do. Willie Colon says, Hi, Paul, I'm stuck. I'll be paying off my two home and buildings this year in 2020. Congratulations. My wife and I would like to invest in more properties, but I'm stuck. What should I do next? Willie, how much equity do you have? How much capital do you have? And let's talk about what you are passionate about and we can see if we can come up with something. Alexis says, I'm from California. I just turned 20. I've got some money to start investing, but no clue where to start. Um, hey, Alexis, thank you for joining. How much do you have and what are you passionate about? I guess I asked that question twice. Okay, we're down to nine minutes, folks. So we're gonna start flying. And if I offend you by not answering your question or answering it too quickly, please forgive me in advance. Uh, Justin Plass says, what interest rate on a single family home? Okay, I answered that. Utkarsh Gautam says, every country has its own 
Uh, how should I start realign? How should I start researching what's popular and what's not? Utgarsh, I would go to your local real estate investing meetups or check on bigger pockets to find people in your area and start connecting. Richard says, I want to buy small mobile home parks. Yeah, I would like to recommend the Frank Rolf uh, training program. Josh Randall says, how do you feel about RV parks? We already talked about that. Shelton says, I'm trying to lease purchase a warehouse for film and video production in Philadelphia. Wow. How can I do this with little or no money up front for at least six months? Partner with somebody? I mean, I really don't really know. Maybe find something that's totally abandoned that uh, where they can't seem to uh, rent it out. You might have to go to a bad neighborhood, though. It's Philadelphia is so popular right now, as you know. Um, Garrett says we have an opportunity for an eight-unit mobile home park, two acres for two ninety nine. dollars Thoughts on due diligence? Garrett, I hate to be a broken record, and I don't mean to be offensive, but I recommend before you buy any mobile home park or anything, go get some training from Frank Rolf or somebody like that. Scott Goulet says... For my next rental property, does it ever make sense to put both my wife and my name on the deed or should I put only one name on the property? Scott, you know, I've wondered that over the years too and I've never come to a conclusion. So I guess it doesn't matter, at least from my point of view. You might want to talk to an attorney, a real estate attorney who might give you a different opinion. Preston Bloomhagen, hello, Preston. Why are you investing in mobile home parks rather than other types of real estate? Oh, my friend. Oh, Get with me on Bigger Pockets or go to wellingscapital.com forward slash resources and get my free special report on mobile home park investing. It's the only asset class out there that has a shrinking supply and an increasing demand every year. There are so, so many things to love about mobile home park investing. Now, I did not say mobile home investing. I hate investing in mobile homes, but uh, I love investing in mobile home parks which is the land and infrastructure hey our own brandon turner is crazy about mobile home parks check out some of the things he loves about it. he's written about it and he's podcast he's done podcasts and webinars about it too nathaniel troop says i'm starting to partner with family and more and more more and more to invest in real estate how do you recommend i set myself up legally continue investing other people's money <clears throat> Nathaniel, if you're to the point where you're taking more than just a very few friends and family money, like if you're over a half a million or more, you should consider getting a Reg D, uh, Regulation 506D, um, uh, SEC uh, attorney and setting up a formal syndication. It'll cost you ten to $20,000 to set up though, so you're going to want to make sure it's going to be worth it. That's the next step for you. Um, I don't know. Uh, what other things might be applicable to your specific situation. Uh, Ziaziz says, what is typical APR for a commercial loan? 65% um, LTV, 10 years, assuming over 800 credit score. You know, it's hard to get a commercial loan. Um, so Aziz, I, I don't really know. I would say in the upper threes. I know one that went for 3.75% interest rate the other day. Rich Zubek says 50,000 available. How would you get started in real estate? Uh, Rich, the beginning of this show, I talked about seven different paths you can get started on. I would, I mean, I know what I would do. I would be an active, actively involved, passive investor with a great syndicator. That's what I would do for sure. And that's what I do, even though I've been at this 19 years. Dulong says, how do you suggest buying an investment house in a medium population city? Uh, I would drive for dollars. It's so hard to find them on the MLS. It's so hard uh, to uh, find anything that makes sense. So I would just drive, 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 take notes, write letters, call. And if you hit a brick wall on a certain house, that's the one to keep pursuing because everybody else is hitting a brick wall on who the owner is as well. Go ask the neighbors, go to the city, go to the county, find them. Uh, you, you can find the owner. Um, uh, when is a good time to invest? Echo, um, there's always a good time. The question is, what are you going to invest in? I would only invest in mom and pop type stuff right now. So before we wrap up here in five minutes, if you like this content, you may want to consider becoming a pro or premium member on Bigger Pockets 
Bigger Pockets is the best investment I've ever made in my 27 years of being an entrepreneur. And I'd highly recommend that you consider joining. Uh, in the meantime, if you like this content, please give us a thumbs up, a like, or a share. I want to make sure Bigger Pockets doesn't fire me. And I want to make sure that YouTube and Facebook know that this content is valuable. So more people can be added to our 1.6 million strong membership at Bigger Pockets. Magno More says, what do I do with three or four people investing money into foreclosures? Oh, that's what you do. All our names go on the deed, then we split the profits. Should I be doing syndication? I never thought so. Magno, I don't think you have to. I mean, but you may want to get a, if you're doing all the work, you might want to get a bigger share of the profit. Like if you all put in 25,000 and that's like 100,000 total, but you're doing all the work, you may want to get like a double portion. Like you might be able to want to get 40%. You're 25 and an hour 15, maybe. And then split the other 60%, you know, 15% each to the other four. Well, that was five people total, but you get the idea. Um, okay, I'm going to have to fly. Al's training info. Maggie, uh, reach out to me. I'll get that to you. Is it easy to get commercial land zone for mobile home parks? Jesse Freeman says, no, Jesse, it's not. The further you are out in an unzoned rural area, the easier, but that's also the worst place to get tenants. Folks, I'm telling you, it's not easy to get into mobile home parks, but it's a great place to be if you can find one that is existing. Um, okay, D. Thomas says... Okay, you're answering someone else's question, which I love, Sylvia... Um, Garcia says, I talked to a banker. They want 25% down. Okay. You guys are talking amongst yourselves, which I'm so glad. Um, I want to know more about your experience with HELOCs. When do you start paying off your properties? Pay Waldo, keep them paid down as low as you can at all times. And then only use the money when you need to, I would pay them off, but keep them in force. Um, if you can, um, so someone says, I live in the Bay Area. I have 150000 in the bank. Do you recommend investing in rental properties or other strategies such as corporate housing? You know, add, add, you've got enough money that you could invest in a really strong passive investment. And you might want to consider that. Alexis Troncoso, same with you. I would not recommend doing a lot of multifamily right now. Add, add says, I'm looking for a job opportunity in real estate. Uh, what do you recommend? I want to build my rental kingdom in the future. Um, I think I mentioned in my earlier talk in the first 18 minutes or so that you may want to consider getting a job as a commercial real estate broker, a commercial lender, a property manager, or an asset manager. Those are the four job types that I know um, would be helpful. And so East Bay, yeah, I was in Fremont recently myself talking to some of our investors. Michael says 100,000 apartment and rentable. I'm not clear on your question. I must have missed it. Transcendental mental. What are your thoughts on turnkey investing? Uh, you know, there's some really good things about it and there's some risks. Uh, check it out on Bigger Pockets. Anything you guys that I didn't answer, yes, it's going to be available, Regina, afterwards to see the whole video. Um, anything I didn't answer, which is a lot of questions here, you can find by putting a question out on a forum on Bigger Pockets, put it worded in a way that a lot of people are going to want to uh, to answer you. Uh, Madan Poon says, "What interest rate is good for investment property loan for a single family house? You know, in the threes. Is that right now? So I think." in the threes. So folks, I am looking forward to getting with you again next Friday. Same bat time, same bat place. Thank you, Zach Quint Gwynn. Thank you, Nikki Frick. Thank you, Brandon Turner. Thank you, uh, everybody at Bigger Pockets. We all appreciate you. We love you. And I am amazed, amazed and thankful that I get to do this. I'm looking forward to a great 2020 with all of you. And I look forward to connecting with you again next week. And if you didn't get your question answered, feel free to reach out to me at Bigger Pockets. Uh, feel free to request any of the information on self storage, mobile home parks, a PDF copy of my book on multifamily. And in 2020, Bigger Pockets is going to be publishing a book on self storage by yours truly. So look for that. 
Again, I'm really grateful to all of you for being here, and I look forward to connecting with you again in 2020. Thank you. Happy New Year. Have a great